Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bureau of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. I'm really excited to speak to him. He actually wrote a book about bubbles. What more of an appropriate time to interview someone who wrote, I think, multiple books on bubbles when we're having all this crazy stuff with MAG7, the NASDAQ 100, artificial intelligence stocks, NVIDIA, SMCI, ARM, those types of companies. He is the co-chief investment officer and partner at Evergreen GAFCAL author of the Haymaker newsletter on Substack, and also the books that I mentioned are must read about technology bubbles and other bubbles. David Hay, thank you for joining me again. Thanks, Jason. Pleasure to be here. And just to be clear, it's only one book, but give me time and give uh, the human race uh, enough opportunity to come create more bubbles. I'm sure I'll be able to come up with at least one more. Well, it seems that that's been kind of the economy since uh, 2008, especially. I mean, they should have allowed a lot of this excess to work off after the technology bubble, and then they didn't. They created the housing bubble, and then it seems like every couple of years there's a new bubble. Correct. I, th I think it's bubbleomics. It's uh, and and maybe it's just become an impossible situation for the powers that be. And there's a very tight correlation. It appears, and I think is logical between federal government tax revenues and the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, of course. So if the stock market's very frothy, then you get better revenues. If the stock market declines and revenues uh, head south and the you know, government spending is so outrageous right now, they really can't afford to have a major bear market. Uh, and you know, how do they do that? How do they prevent that? Well, one factoid is that uh, the CBO, the Congressional Bud Budget Office, is estimating that the net interest expense for the U.S. government will be 3% of GDP next year, which is you know, just an astronomical number, well over a trillion dollars in, you know, in, in uh, simple terms. So, you know, what did they do uh, to, to keep things together? And there was a very interesting surge by uh, liquidity into the government bond market of just a shocking amount came in last week. Uh, which looked like it was uh, I mean, trying to figure out where it came from. I was reading Luke Groman, who studies this stuff very closely, and he's like, what's that? You know, where did that uh, emanate? And so, it, it, yeah, whether the government's got the ability to keep this uh, speculative train rolling indefinitely, I don't know. But it uh, does seem like they have very little choice but to do so. They put themselves into a very difficult situation. And as you point out, constantly re relying on bubbles is, uh, you know, just can't work long term. And I think the real reality check is going to be the government bond market. And if the gov government bond market gets away from them and you get interest rates uh, running up like they were for a while in the third quarter of last year, you know, that's when it's likely going to be game over. But they, they I never underestimate the, the power of people like Janet Yellen and Jay Powell to pull another rabbit out of the hat. We are in full agreement about government tax receipts. I, I think I would argue, and I've heard Luke Roman say this too, that it's basically national security policy about the S&P 500 and making sure that the general stock market indexes uh, do not stay low for a long period of time. I really think the rules have changed a lot post-2008. Let me also add its home prices too. So the government has decided, especially because uh, state and local governments are so reliant on property taxes and they're flush with cash now because they've been raising property taxes because property prices, uh, property uh, home prices, excuse me, have not collapsed, even though interest rates and mortgages are at relatively high uh, amounts, uh, relatively high mortgage costs that have not been seen, what, in 12 years or 15 years, uh, a large amount of time. Yeah, for sure. And I think where you're going with this is that price discovery is just, uh, it's gone the way the dodo bird, you know, whether it's with uh, the housing market, which is frozen. Yeah, that theoretically housing prices are still at very high levels, but good luck trying to sell. And there's certain markets that are still very strong that you probably could. But, uh, I, you know, just look at the number of new homes for sale or sold, not for sale, but sold. And, you know, that's been in a, in a definite bear market. And when you come to the stock market, what is it? Over 50% of money now is managed, not even managed, it's just indexed. So you've got uh, very little price discovery in the uh, stock market. And then, of course, with bonds, you had a tremendous distortion with all the central bank intervention in bonds. Now they're trying to restore that. And, you know, when you've got bond yields up in the 4 to 5% range, I mean, that's those are, you know, real interest rates. As, you know, Jim Grant from the Grant's Interest Rate Observer says it's nice to have interest rates to observe again. So it's that is good for a lot of people. I mean, people, well, a lot of wealthy people. It's good. It's not so good for companies that are highly leveraged or consumers who are highly leveraged. But um, it does, you know, raise the question of how is the government going to be able to finance itself at, at four to five to even 
potentially 6% interest rates. So again, I think it's going to be the U.S. Treasury market that really snaps and kind of pulls down this whole Ponzi scheme. Or the Fed has to come in and reverse quantitative tightening, which is balance sheet reduction and the next crisis, which a lot of the fund managers are saying is potentially commercial real estate in the next year or two. I think that's where potentially the bailouts are going to have to occur. And normally with the Fed, with the policies and D.C., the policies post-2008, they don't let these things work themselves out. They don't allow... Uh, bankruptcy contagion, debt deflation, asset prices falling, tax receipts, they don't allow that type of thing to occur now for more than I would say a couple quarters, not even six months. It's just really, it's just really sad. They don't allow, you know, the free market forces, bankruptcy and deflation, like what has occurred in the past. Right. When you've got down this road as far as they have, it's it's almost like, you know, they crossed the Rubicon a long time ago. So it's, I, I don't know that they can allow it. Now, the question is, can they, do they really have the means to prevent it? Uh, they're certainly going to do everything they can. And I think QE will be a last resort. And I'm on record saying that I think Jay Powell will resign before the Fed restarts QE, not to say a more compliant, pliable Fed chairman wouldn't do that or chairwoman, but uh, I don't think it's going to be him. Did you uh, see the Fed those... minutes today about commercial real estate? Danielle DiMartino Booth, stop, sorry to interrupt you. Did you see what the Fed was saying about commercial real estate? They were hinting that like there's way worse problems coming soon in commercial real estate. Well, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Financial Times had an article about that. I do read Danielle's stuff on a regular basis. Didn't get to it yet today, but yeah, the, no surprise. And I would, would say and have been saying, I don't think the banking crisis is over, but it went a lot of months without flaring up. And then out of the blue, we had New York Community Bank and the, whatever the Japanese bank was that took a big hit because of U.S. commercial real estate. I think there's more coming for sure. I don't think that's by any means solved. But uh, again, they're very, very clever, These uh, the, the Treasury and the Fed. And will they come up with something? For example, will they force banks to buy U.S. Treasuries and hold those as reserves at zero interest? I think that could be a tactic they use to try to cheaply finance the U.S. government, but, you know, there, there'll be negative effects of that. It certainly wouldn't be great for the banking industry. And I know some people like Luke Roman feel such a move would be highly inflationary. So it's uh, it's very bizarre. I mean, it's is I that what Japan did? Is that what Japan where they stuff like the zero coupon, zero coupon perpetual bonds? Didn't Ben Bernanke suggest that Japan start that? Well, he certainly advised them on how to get out of their deflationary period uh, and he may have suggested that. I mean, they obviously went to zero even negative interest rates. So, uh, you know, basically any bank buying government bonds in Japan for years and years and years was getting a zero interest rate. So effectively they did it. In this environment, it would be much more coercive because you do have, you know, 5% T-bill rates. So banks can't access that kind of return and are forced to hold special government securities that are perhaps for reserve requirements that don't earn anything, and they're going to be furious. But yeah, you know, not a lot of sympathy on Main Street for Wall Street banks. So I don't think that would hurt uh, hurt you know the the authorities from a political standpoint. And well, I think but the two big, a, I think the five or six largest too big to fail banks. I think they're going to be okay. I, I think the regional banks are the ones looking at a lot of the problems. The regional banks have a higher percentage of high interest consumer loans, and then also with the uh, commercial real estate. Absolutely. I mean, it's the small and medium-sized banks that are mostly exposed, they have the greatest exposure to commercial, and, and of course, the real problems are with office. So I think it's just a matter of time before more banks do what New York Community Bank did here recently, and maybe even worse. Actually, their loan portfolio was considered to be quite low risk until they did the merger. I think it was Flagstaff they bought, but Flagstar, uh, but because they have basically loans on rent-controlled apartment buildings in New York that you know, we're constantly full because they were the rents were so far below market. But anyway, just there's a lot of crazy stuff going on out there for sure. What what I've been kind of vectoring toward and actually thinking about doing a, an addendum to my book on is the great what I call the great disconnect, which is this divergence between the really perilous state of the U.S. government and the U.S. economy, the U.S. country. Uh, you know, you listen to and I'm sure you've heard this, too. I, so many people that I respect whether it's Jeff Gunlock or Darius Dale or uh, Grant Williams and uh, name just a few that I've heard here recently that have brought up the fact that we're in the fourth turning. So this is Neil Howe's famous book, The Fourth Turning is Here, which is basically a mega crisis, the kind of crisis that only comes along once every 80 or 90 years. 
So this is the first one since the Great Depression and World War II. And yet, I mean, in those days, the stock market was extremely depressed. Today, we've got one of the most expensive stock markets of all time. I would argue it's one of the most speculative markets, again, looking a lot like 2021. And yet, you know, we've got half of America worried about a civil war. And we're looking at one of the most contentious, dissatisfying presidential elections uh, in U.S. history. And that also has the potential to really further fracture the country, which that's the last thing we need. So you know, there's just so many things where, I mean, whether it's geopolitically, the threats to the dollar as a reserve currency, you know, the uh, fragile nature of the U.S. Treasury market, as we talked about, requiring all these these special tricks to kind of keep things going and financing the government. And yet the stock market is just, it's acting like it's the late 1990s, which is maybe a good segue because as we talked before we started recording, I've been having these flashbacks to February 24 years ago. So at that time I'd been in the business 21 years. So I'm now 45 years in. And so I've seen a lot of cycles, but that was one of the most painful periods. I think it really was the most painful period of my career because I had started telling people back in well, it was 1998, maybe 97, that the NASDAQ was crazy. I know when it hit 2,500, I thought this is, I mean, the valuations make no sense. And by February of 2000, so 24 years ago right now, it was 4,600. And it would hit the following month, so just a few weeks later, it would hit 5,000. And so it did really double from where I thought it was nuts. I did the same thing with the Nikkei in Japan in the late 80s, said it was crazy when it hit 20,000, it went to 40,000. I got a knack for being about 100% wrong on those bubbles. And that's the thing with bubbles, you just... You can recognize them, which the Fed says you can't, but you can. I think it's very easy to recognize the bubble, but it's virtually impossible to know when it's going to burst. Yeah. And they do have a tendency to go higher and higher than you think they should. Yeah, I agree. The value investors get killed. A lot of the other stocks, it's it's not um, the breadth of this quote unquote bull market. It's not really a bull market because you don't have all these stocks and all these different companies doing well. It's very concentrated into what NVIDIA. It's not even the MAG7 anymore. So about the MAG5. Most of the S&P right, 500 Tesla, Tesla's been kicked out. And then the S&P 500, I mean, the the index is doing well, but the individual companies with 400 over 493 out of 500 are, have not had uh, enormous earnings growth and revenue growth. So they're not posting kind of the bull market activity, the behavior, the fundamental improvements that you would see in a normal bull market. Absolutely. And that's another echo of what happened 24 years ago, because uh, you had the same thing back then. It was a very narrow bull market. Most stocks actually entered a bear market in uh, the spring of 1998. So as the NASDAQ was going higher and higher, there were a few others. There were some of the blue chips back then that were very in favor, like Gillette and GE and Coke. They got up to 40, 50 times earnings. But most of the rest of the market was going down or at least sideways. And so just look today at the divergence between the Russell 2000 and the NASDAQ. It's huge. It was huge back then. It was another, uh, well, the gold stocks were also very poor performers at that time. And that's, uh, of course, repeating. Energy stocks were very out of favor and very cheap. That's repeating. Uh, look at the bond market. The bond market back then was under a lot of pressure. The Fed had been raising rates a lot. Uh, they cut briefly after the Asian crisis and because of Y2K fears. And then they started and they realized that, oh, my gosh, this bubble is really getting out of hand. So they started cranking interest rates up you know, sharply. And then the bond market went down in price, up in yield further. They actually, the, the 30-year treasury got to a yield of about six and three quarters. So, you know, at that point in, in the early part of 2000, all these things together, including just ridiculous overvaluation, valuation, finally hit and the stock market gave way. Now, I think what's different this time is that you mentioned the Magnificent Seven, and yes, some of those are very expensive, but they're like NVIDIA. I mean, it's just reported fantastic earnings and, and uh, revenue growth once again. So this has been, you know, to a large degree, an earnings and pro uh, revenue-driven uh, appreciation of the stock. Now, the multiple's gone up a bit more than earnings have, so there has been multiple expansion. But I think where the real problems in the market are, like the next level down, Companies that you really haven't heard of, but you know, just pick up an investor's daily sometime and go through their leading stock because they're very momentum driven, and their top stocks tend to have unbelievably high valuations in a market like this. I mean, eighty times earnings, over a hundred times earnings. A lot of times they don't have any earnings, and yet they still sell at very high multiples of their sales in that case. And so I think that's where you have the real distortions and where you're going to see a tremendous amount of wealth destruction, which is similar to what happened in 2021. I mean, the NASDAQ went down 35% right during uh, 2022. 
but it was the uh, what I'd call the profitless tech stocks and the meme stocks and those set things that went down 80, 90 percent. I mean, they had an absolute wipeout after that unbelievable speculative peak in 2021. Uh, but, you know, there were you know back in, in the, the late 90s, early 2000, you had kind of the same situation where you had. But it was actually some of the companies that we now consider to be blue chips like Microsoft and Cisco that had, you know, the 100, 100 PE type of uh, price sticker on them. So there are a lot of similarities. There are differences. There were a tremendous number of IPOs back then, which created a lot of supply. You haven't seen that this time. But also remember that the federal government back in the late 90s was running surpluses to the point that Alan Greenspan publicly warned that we may not have a U.S. Treasury bond market by 2010 because we're going to pay <laughs> off all our debt. I mean, that's rather different, don't you think? Yeah, I would also argue that the macro factor. So I, I think we're also kind of having an echo, a similar tech bubble to what happened, what you described in 1999, 2000. There's a ton of um, anecdotal stories, too, that I'm hearing, like even locally here in the D.C. metro area, whether it's on dating apps and people bragging or friends that I didn't even know like the stock market. And all of a sudden they're messaging me and they I didn't even know they had any interest whatsoever in the stock market. And they're bragging about all their options trades that they just took a uh, stock options class that has 80% success rate on like QQQ and SPY and some of these other max seven tech stocks and bragging about their returns. I'm getting these text messages from people talking about how easy the money is for these big tech stocks. And then you just see the article headlines, um, whether it's the Motley Fool article saying that uh, buying shares at SMCI is going to turn you into a millionaire. It's almost the exact same stuff that you saw out of the, the um, crazy tech stocks with almost uh, no earnings and very little revenue in 1998, 1999, same types of articles from Motley Fool. Then there was a, an analyst, I think on business television a couple of days ago, and the analyst said there is no bear case whatsoever for NVIDIA. <laughs> Right. And, and, you know, to talk about NVIDIA, I mean, it's obviously this has been one of the most amazing success stories ever in uh, U.S. economic history. But at some point, I don't know when that point is, they're going to report a quarter that disappoints the market. It may still be good, but it won't be good enough. And you'll lose, you know, 20, 30 percent of the market valuation right away. Now, to get a real terrible decline, such as was seen, you know, when the NASDAQ went down almost 80 percent after the big tech bubble, that started, you know, that popped in the spring, early spring, or maybe it was late winter 2000. And, uh, you know, that was a 1930s type of decline in a major index, the index that was by far the most popular among you know, retail investors at that time. To, to get that kind of decline, you're going to have to have some really severe problems. I mean, it's not going to be just disappointing that, it, you know, the earnings were up, you know, 40% and they were supposed to be up 50%. You know, that's when you can get a 20 to 30% decline. You look at what happened to Palo Alto Network yesterday. I mean, over the last two days, it's down almost 30%, just boom. And, you know, was that $40 billion market cap wipeout? And so that that can happen. But I, you, I think you're going to have to have a recession or, you know, maybe an intensifying banking crisis or government bond market crisis to really get a serious shakeout and not just a correction. Yeah, but, I agree. Uh, I, do think, I think the macro I, I think factors... The I also think the macro factors are very, very different than the last tech bubble in 1999 and 2000. I think the global economy, whether it's European Union, United Kingdom, Japan, China, they're having immense problems right now. I think there's a lot of flight capital from managed money, retail investors too out of China. I think a lot of flight capital is coming to U.S. stocks. Well, I think that's true. I mean, what is the, the U.S. market cap now is 70% uh, of the, you know, that of the world. And what are we, 18, 19% of GDP? I mean, it's just phenomenal. So yes, it's, a, but you know, we have these very special tech companies that have had a tremendous uh, earnings history. And so a lot of it has been earnings driven. And, you know, that's where it gets a little scary is can you keep up that kind of momentum? And I think that's going to be hard to do. And you, know, you just get kind of the law of large numbers on these things. It's one thing to grow really rapidly when you're relatively small, but the bigger you get, the harder that is. So at some point, something's going to happen that causes people to to realize that this isn't, you know, this isn't like you were saying, this this magical money machine. And whenever you start seeing those kind of, it's basically what you're describing was almost like the digital equivalent of Joe Kennedy's uh, shoeshine guy, you know, back in 1929 when he started giving Joe Kennedy stock tips. And that's when Kennedy, you know, reportedly sold most of his stocks. I'm not sure it was exactly that. That's uh, accurate story, but there's probably some truth to it.
Well, Stanley Druckenmiller just did something similar. We saw in his 13 Fs. He is taking profits on these stocks and he's rotating into uh, cheaper assets, uh, you know, with earnings and cash flow that the market hates. So he is uh, doing cycle rotation or asset rotation. I mean, he he has a better track record than anyone. Uh, and he had I'm glad you brought that up. I, I meant to bring that up because I did actually see that. And uh, I think that is very interesting. What he's doing is actually buying probably the most hated sector on the planet, which is gold mining stocks. I'm not saying he's only buying them, but he's definitely buying some of those. And uh, that's I think that's a very attractive rate to spend. About yeah, four, I think he's buying basement. I think he bought tech, which is a coal miner, base metal miner, although I think they may have coal, sold some of their coal assets. And I think he's buying oil, too. So he is diversifying into commodities because they're cheap and they're hated. And there's there's legit profits there for a lot of these oil and energy companies right now. I think the demand long term is going to be there. And an important thing, though, about the um, bubble here that we're seeing in the tech bubble, do you think a lot of it is because of index funds and passive investing? Sure, absolutely. I mean, money just goes in regardless of whether there's intrinsic value and that money flowing in doesn't worry about, you know, what the equity risk premium is, for example, which is, you know, basically comparing the earnings yield on stocks to the, the prevailing uh, 10 year treasury rate. And when it's really skinny like it is now, that's usually a time that uh, you want to be getting out. But, you know, these computers and algos and and mindless money flows don't pay any attention to that. So, uh, you know, I think that that, that process uh, magnifies and just intensifies these these bubbles. And I do think these bubbles are happening more frequently. I saw Kevin Muir from the Macro Tourist, very, very bright guy. And he's talking about how these really are kind of a series of mini bubbles that inflate and then deflate. And another one comes right up behind it. And. I think there's truth to that too. And I think it's just that there's been too much money around there and there's just too much money that isn't, you know, it's like my partner, Louis Goff says, you, you want to figure out, is there more money than fools or more fools than money? <laughs> and you know, right now, I think there's just so much money out there that, uh, you know, the fools are, are uh, you know, cutting a fat hog, but at some time they're going to get slaughtered. And I think the higher it goes up, the worse it's going to be. Do you think What's that this... you know, just, just just for you know once what, what I find fast I, I you know kind of like with your experience I talk to people all the time and they know what I write and publish and that I'm skeptical that this is going to go on forever and I tell them you know, look I'm selectively bullish selectively bearish there's definitely some things to be bullish on but they're it's just like they have amnesia about what happened in 2022 I mean that was a that was the worst year for balanced portfolios since 1871 and that's I do feel good that we got our book out digitally published before that happened or in the very, very early stages of 2022. But it's just like, well, it never happened. And it, it did happen. It was. Are you talking about theory. modern portfolio theory and like the 60, 40 and the bond funds, how a lot over the last like three years, the bond funds, a lot of those U S treasury only long bond funds or ones that were using leverage. They got, uh, they got wrecked. Sure. They got wrecked, but even just a traditional 60, 40, 50, 50 balance portfolio did very poorly because it didn't, the normal hedging aspect of the bond side of the portfolio didn't work. You lost as much money on, uh, ignoring the NASDAQ, but if you compare the, you know, the long treasury, well, the long treasury got hit pretty hard. So we'd actually have to look at the uh, the Barclays Ag. That was down uh, about what the S&P was. I mean, you, were, you lost 18% on both sides of the portfolio, which that's why it was such a cataclysmic year for balanced portfolios. And the question is, do bonds provide the portfolio protection that they used to? And I think the answer is no. And that's why I keep coming back to the bond market. I think that we are in the midst of a secular bear market in bonds. And for 40 years, I was a bond market bull until the summer of 2020. So that's when after COVID, the 10-year treasury yield got down to 0.053%. So for all intents and purposes, a half a percent. <clears throat> and all those inflationary pressures were building. And I thought this is crazy. Uh, I think treasury bonds are the short of a lifetime or may maybe several lifetimes. And we really position our, our portfolios accordingly. And uh, this has been a nice little rally. Well, it was a nice little rally when we went from 5% down to 380 on the 10 year, but now we're back up, you know, 430, uh, kind of a painful sell off. And, and then, of course, inflation's uh, turning out to be kind of sticky. And so, uh, yeah, I think, I think we're in the midst of a multi decade, decade bond bear market. <laughs> Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, it just depends on Fed policy. But I think even if the Fed does do a 180, I think a lot of foreigners are looking and saying, like, we don't like the deficits out of D.C. By the way, we're recording this interview on Wednesday, February 21st, 2024. The 10-year U.S. Treasury yield is back up to 4.325%, like David said. The last six to eight months, if you look at a chart of the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield, it's been a roller coaster. It's crazy. It literally looks like a roller coaster. 
Yeah, that's something that, that uh, people, uh, I think it's Harley Bassman that created the bond move index, which is basically the VIX of the bond market. And it's been oscillating at very high levels. And that is a red flag. That's not good to see. And clearly the uh, the, uh, the authorities in, in D.C. are worried about the bond market. They're trying to figure out ways to for the government to be able to, to finance itself affordably. And, you know, that's that's kind of like the ultimate policy making challenge. Do you You're see right it? about the foreign foreigners, I do think, are, are wisely waking up to the fact that these treasuries are now certificates of confiscation. Well, it's the size of the budget deficits and how quickly the national debt is growing. I mean, for now, it's it's OK. And I'm using air quotes here. It's OK because there's still demand for the treasuries. But what happens when the, the national debt's at 50 trillion and rates are not um, even if rates go down a little bit? I mean, the interest payments on the debt are going to be one of the two highest line, line items going forward for the foreseeable future, maybe perpetually. Yes, that's why I made that uh, that comment about the three percent of GDP going to interest only by next year. Again, that's not some wide-eyed uh, tinfoil wearing hat person. That's actually from the Congressional Budget Office. So we're we're at a point where the, the government is, and and by the way, it's not just them that's worrying about this. You've got some very influential people like Larry Summers, Bob Rubin, uh, is it, uh, Nassim Tlaib recently said that it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's an absolute disaster. And and so these people that previously, they, they were influential enough that they wouldn't say things like that because it would be like yelling fire in a crowded theater. But they're now starting to, to say the quiet part out loud, which is the federal government's finances are absolutely a disaster. Now, the kind of the, the calming words that often flow after that are, but it's not, that that flashpoint's not here yet. We haven't we're not to the edge of the cliff. I think we're a lot closer to the edge of the cliff than they're admitting. Maybe they just simply can't. But I think this could be the year when you have a, a really serious point of reckoning in the bond market. Do you see a scenario where quantitative tightening ends and the Fed announces some type of balance sheet reversal? Maybe it's for bailouts for regional banks or a new liquidity program, or maybe the Fed just creates and DC is like a joint program. They create like a new government sponsored enterprise like a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, and they start sticking the office buildings there. So it's kind of a bailout funds, but they keep rates high. Do you see a scenario where they kind of like distort things further with like balance sheet expansion, rate cuts or, or no rate cuts, and then they keep rates high, uh, just more distortions like that? We already saw that, right? A year ago, or almost a year ago, with the bank term funding program, which uh, basically put a, you know a big bandaid on the uh, the banking crisis at that time, and a lot of people felt that that was kind of stealth QE, and it worked. But now it's you know it's coming up for uh, uh, for renewal, probably won't be renewed, and the, the banks started gaming that, and we're you know, doing an interest rate arbitrage, and that really upset the Fed, probably stupid on the part of the banks. But I think they will try to do things like that. They'll, they'll try, especially if it is a crisis where they can. You know, spin it that this is just you know kind of like in a modern day tarp type of thing. And I have seen, I think it was Luke Roman who was talking about how they may incentivize Fannie and Freddie, uh, which you know have big portfolios, to buy assets that they need purchased, and that they may actually let those guys go public and and be able to raise capital so that they have enough equity capital, and then they would be you know leveraged ten to one or maybe even more, so they could be big buyers of government securities. It's I hadn't seen that elsewhere. It's kind of an intriguing concept. I mean, it's again more well, ledger domain, smoke I, and mirrors. But I had heard they had that that Janet Yellen was floating it out a couple of months ago. They were planning on spinning out Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, but that was so they could like make it publicly traded, so the U.S. federal government could get kind of get profits by selling the equity. The problem is, it's not going to pass the smell test for institutional investors. They're going to take a look at the gap. For Fannie and Freddie and like all the toxic garbage that they've been buying since 2008 and the 30 year treasury, some of that stuff, they're not going to the private institutional investors, the large pools of capital are not going to like the accounting that they see. Yeah, maybe there's a way that they can dress it up. I don't know. I mean, again, I, I'm just saying this is a, uh, I think they're at a point where they're in desperate straits. And so they're going to try things that are, you know, right on the edge and some will be successful. I mean, you got to say that the bank term funding program was a success. Now, maybe it'll have a, you know, a payback at some point. But for now, they did an awfully good job of triaging that one. As you could do that for a few banks. What do you do if there starts to be dozens? That becomes a bigger issue. But uh, they're, I, I wouldn't underestimate their power to keep these things, you know, keep throwing the duct tape on and the bailing wire around it to, to keep the show on the road. Oh, we're in agreement. I just don't think they'll spin out Fannie and Freddie because they don't want investors looking at at the gap 
the accounting books. They don't want to see all the stuff that was stuffed in there. In in fact, I've actually heard the opposite. I heard that they're talking about maybe a third government sponsored enterprise already, like a third one similar to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, like a third, and that'll boost the jobs numbers. So they'll create more government jobs, a third government sponsored enterprise, a bad bank, and they're going to start sticking the commercial real estate in there. I heard that's already being discussed here in DC for a new bailout plan for commercial real estate when things do get worse. No, that would just kind of fit under the the heading of uh, you know creative but desperate measures. So I want to ask you about your thoughts on rate cuts. In your opinion, does something big have to break before the Fed cuts rates? Well, yes, and that the something big could be the jobs market. I do think that in this latest jobs number we had three hundred fifty three, the official number was just outrageous, and it just doesn't make sense when you look at how layoffs are soaring. If you look at According to Jeff Gunlock, everyone with CBC, uh, like last week or the week before, that 88% of states are seeing rising unemployment over the last six months. Lizanne Saunders from Schwab. Again, these are very mainstream, not alarmist types of individuals. And she's pointing out that you've had a loss of full-time jobs of 1.4 million over the last three months, which is very rare. So we're seeing uh, reductions of full-time jobs and increasing part-time jobs. So it's, uh, and, and that can actually throw off the non-farm payroll survey, which is the main one, because they if somebody's working two jobs, they count that as two jobs. If they're working three, they count that as three, and they're even if they're part-time jobs. And so it, I just think that data is really unreliable right now. And I think there's there's much more of a risk of a hard landing than markets are factoring in right now. Now, obviously, we do get a hard landing, then the Fed is going to start to cut. But I think it's going to take a fair amount of evidence coming out for that to be clear. And right now, for sure, the soft landing folks are doing a victory lap and high-fiving each other, which includes Janet Yellen. She's been saying soft landing and, you know, with her kind of smoke style. And uh, I don't think that's what it's going to be. I think it's going to be a hard landing. Now, they may be a little defer at that. And what's, I will admit that I thought we'd have a recession last year. But I also didn't see it coming that we're going to go from a $1 trillion deficit to $2 trillion. You really can't have a recession when you have that kind of deficit spending. So we've had this enormous fiscal stimulus that was working against the, against the monetary tightening of the Fed. Now, this year, we've had, uh, you know, the fiscal stim is kind of leveled at a very high level. Although, I don't know. I mean, I, I look at the first three months of the fiscal year, it looks to me like the deficit increased. But we see the CBO saying, oh, no, the deficit's going to be down this year. So... I think that's still open for debate. But what we clearly got was a tr dramatic easing of financial conditions. So even though the Fed didn't cut, you know, just by throwing out the three possible cuts this year, which is the red meat that they gave the market back in December, it triggered this. All, I mean, the round market was already rallying to begin with. Stocks and bonds were started rallying in late October. Then in December, when Powell did his pivot, you know, took off again. So you've got, for example, credit spreads. Credit spreads are down at very, very tight levels. That's really positive for financial assets. It's positive for the economy. And so with those down there, it's kind of hard to see a recession right around the corner either. But as we know, credit spreads can change very quickly. And we're already starting to see that interestingly triple C. So the junkiest part of the bond market is, is, is seeing spreads widen out kind of sharply here recently. So you have to keep an eye on that. Credit spreads are fantastically important. And if you doubt me, just go back and look at what happened in March of 2020. So the global economy is locking down and the stock market absolutely took off uh, by the, at the end of March and into early April of uh, 2020, even though COVID was uh, becoming a worse problem, not a better problem. Why? Well, the Fed intervened in the corporate bond market, which was collapsing. So the Fed said, we're going to start buying corporate bonds. And that actually had been something I had predicted for several years before. People laughed at me, said, they can't do that. It's illegal. I said, don't worry, they'll figure it out. And sure enough, uh, just by making the announcement, that's what triggered the bond, the corporate bond market to take flight, and then stocks fell right behind, you know, drafting behind them. And we had that, uh, the beginning of the amazing bull market, even though the COVID news stayed bad for, you know, like six to 12 months. And I don't think the vaccines came out until late that year, and they weren't really widely distributed until the first part of 2021, but the market was off to the races. So credit spreads are hugely important, and the Fed knows that. So I, I do think that if they start to widen dram dramatically, the Fed will do another intervention there. That was probably their easiest. They only spent something like $18 billion buying corporate bonds back in 2020. That was the best bang for the buck they've ever gotten, you know, compared to what they had to do in the global financial crisis when they let spreads 
well, junk bonds got to over 20% yields uh, in early 09. And that's why virtually every bank in the U.S. was absolutely bust. So anyway, that's that's a positive. Credit spreads are very tight. And another positive, you know, just to be fair, because I think you got to look at the facts as they are, uh, the, when you have a positive January, almost every year the market goes up. It's a very high success rate. Now, obviously in 2000, didn't work that way. So maybe not a bad idea to remember the circumstances that were prevailing back then. But I do think there are a number of parallels. Did you see the speech that Jeff Gunlock gave at the Grants Interest Rate Observer Conference back in October where he talked about how he hired someone from the Federal Reserve Bank and they disclosed about whether or not they should buy corporate debt? And then all the people at the Fed, like the governors and stuff, were saying, well, it's illegal. And then they're like, well, we'll just change the laws and then we can buy them afterwards. So, I, I mean, that's kind of the rationale for the people in policy now. So, like you were saying Everyone's like, oh, it's illegal. And they're like, oh, we'll just get the laws changed first. Oh, we'll get the politicians or the lobbyists to help us out and we'll change the laws and then we'll we'll do the ballots or the liquidity programs. And that seems to be the way they do policies now post-2008. Oh, absolutely. And it's uh, it's just a fact of life. And it's, you know, I, I do believe at some point it's going to have a very nasty payback, but probably not yet. Uh, I keep thinking of what is going to really be you know, the shoe that drops that, that really causes this thing to, you know, for people, for the markets to realize Emperor has no clothes. And I, that's why I keep coming back to the U.S. government bond market and kind of for the reason you were saying that the, the overseas investors are much more skeptical about what the U.S. is doing. And clearly foreign central banks, and I don't think this gets nearly enough attention, are electing that uh, U.S. treasuries are not the best reserve asset. Everybody's you know, thinking about, well, the dollar is losing its reserve currency status. I think what's really happening first is the treasuries are losing their reserve asset status, and it's being increasingly replaced by gold. And I think that's why you see gold still up over 2000. You know, it's, it's not made a major new high, but it's, it's made a marginal new high, but it's done so in the face of high real interest rates, which is pretty remarkable, and complete disinterest on the part of U.S. retail investors. They're selling out of their gold ETFs, and they hate the gold mining stocks that we talked about earlier, but the foreign central banks are just relentless, methodical buyers of bullion uh, that they're holding in increasingly in lieu of U.S. treasuries. Yeah, we're in agreement about that, about foreign central banks, the non-G7, especially after the Russia sanctions, uh, the gold purchases within, I think, four or five months started increasing massively by non-G7 central banks. Also, private sector demand for physical gold out of China. I mean, the January 2024 data from Shanghai, it was just, it was a record. I don't think it's ever been that high in the last 15 or 20 years. It was a record amount of imports, almost 300 tons in a single month for January 2024 out of uh, Shanghai. Yep. And, you know, the Shanghai gold has been trading at a significant premium to gold in America. And that's, I think that would indicate that there's a lot of demand for it over there as well. I think another problem that's happening, David, and we're going to see this, I think, with the voter here in the United States for November 2024 elections. We saw this a little bit with the congressional elections last November. There is a huge bifurcated economy, in my opinion, um, between haves and have nots and the wealth disparity, especially with Federal Reserve Bank policy and D.C. spending. I mean, the, a lot of that spending out of D.C. is kind of positively towards GDP. But the average person, if you're a small business owner or middle class, you're getting absolutely killed with high interest rate debt, stagflation, shrinkflation, all these things. And a lot of people my age, I'm I'm in my low 40s. We're younger, we might not be able to afford, even if we saved up and worked hard or worked multiple jobs to be able to buy a home, uh, unless we're getting financial help from our parents or grandparents or something. Right. That's how a lot of young people are buying their homes. But yeah, it's very unfortunate. It's That was one of the themes of my book is that when you create these kinds of distortions and, and artificially drive down the price of money, so then you artificially drive up the, the price of things like homes. And, you know, it was worse in Europe where they were actually, as you know, in certain European countries, uh, home buyers were getting paid by their bank to take out a mortgage. Just unbelievably Alice in Wonderland kind of stuff, nonsensical, and yet it was happening. And here it didn't get that extreme, although, you know, as you might remember, Donald Trump was beating on the Fed saying we should have negative interest rates like they have in Europe. And fortunately, Jay Powell resisted. But it, they got too low. As, you know, when you get down to 3% mortgages, you had to be an idiot not to... Uh, you know, to term out your loans. And that's one reason why all these rate increases, frankly, haven't had much bite yet is because both corporations and individuals did do a lot of turning out of their, their debt 
unlike the federal government, I've been very critical that the government didn't take advantage of those, you know, half percent, one percent, one and a half percent type of yields and go longer term. And then others have said, well, you know, they really couldn't do that. There really wasn't much demand for those long treasuries even back then. And I think they could have tested the bid a little better than they did, but it's probably true. That's it's um, uh, and uh, there's just there's just a real problem coming up and I think this is going to be the year where we have to face it, you know, head on. Are companies seeing in the conference calls that the consumer, I, I know with some of the food companies, so like Kraft Heinz and some of those others, they're talking about how a lot of the consumers, these are um, middle class or below middle class consumers are starting to trade down. They don't want to pay for the higher price increases from inflation and shrinkflation. So they're starting to substitute and trade down to lower priced items. Yeah, absolutely. Well, even at Walmart, you're seeing that, uh, that more affluent people are shopping at Walmart. That's what their CFO commented on here recently. So you definitely are seeing that. Uh, and I think the other thing that's that's interesting, I, I can't remember if we talked about this last time, but one thing I follow very closely are breakouts and breakdowns, multi-year breakouts and multi-year breakdowns, usually with stocks. And I'm not the only one that does. John, Paul Tudor Jones calls them range expansions. And it's it's the number one way to, to make money or avoid losing money that I found in my career. And the way I proved it, by the way, Jason, was in my own long short account where it, it, invariably I would ignore these multi-year breakouts because the stock was very expensive, then it would double and I'd lose a ton of money. And I finally, uh, well, Walmart here recently, I covered my short back in December because it had a multi-year breakout and it's it's gone up, uh, you know, it hasn't been huge, but it's up another, what, 10% or so since since December. But uh, some of these things after they break, Tesla's a great example. When Tesla broke out of that multi-year range it had been in, I think the breakout was back in 2019. I mean, it just exploded from there. Obviously, a very unusual situation. I think it's in the process of imploding, by the way. But my bigger point is that you can do the same thing with macroeconomic data. It's it's just amazing to me how you'll see something that's in a relatively tight range. And let's talk about credit card delinquencies or auto loan delinquencies. And then they break out of that range and then they go. And that's what we're seeing. Major multi-year breakouts in credit card delinquencies and auto loan delinquencies. You're also seeing corporate bankruptcy surge, individual bankruptcies are surging. So there's there's all kinds of you know warning lights uh, going off right now, but don't tell that to the people that are loading up on the Magnificent Seven or you know, maybe some of the stocks right below that as we talked about earlier. Yeah, I think a lot of this is also like flight capital. So I think um, that Financial Times article from a couple weeks ago where they're interviewing Chinese fund managers, uh, Chinese retail investors inside China and talking about how they've lost faith in Chinese stocks and Chinese real estate. So they're not going to keep their savings in a Chinese bank, especially if they're worried about a, a Chinese yuan devaluation. So they're going to go buy Bitcoin. You're seeing Bitcoin prices spike. The physical gold prices, as you mentioned, in Shanghai, people are paying a premium for, for physical gold, not gold mining stocks. And then also there's flight capital that's coming to U.S. stocks. So I think that's a big macro factor that was not present in the last tech bubble in 1999 and 2000. Yeah, you're right. It was different. I mean, back then it was more of just like uh, you know, the U.S. was such a magnet because we were doing so well. I mean, we were the you know military superpower. We hadn't gone into Iraq and Afghanistan yet. We were like we were talking about earlier, running these huge surpluses. Looked like we we're going to be debt free. We'd had the great growth of the late 1990s as the internet took off. So we looked really good back then. And that's why a lot of capital was coming in to the U.S. at that point. Whereas, and you're right, it, it certainly China has shot itself in the foot, you know, shot off a lot of its toes. Uh, it could be an interesting turnaround market. I, uh, I was listening to Kirill Seloff, if I'm saying that name right here recently, and uh, even Oak Tree, they're starting to to go after Chinese stocks. They think they're really undervalued. And you know, we got my partner thinks that they're great buys and it's uh, it could be the ultimate contrarian trade is to to buy some Jam uh, Chinese stocks right now. But uh, we've been bullish on Japan, and Japan has been a very good performing market despite the weak yen. I think the yen looks really attractive right now as a uh, you know, depressed currency. And you can for American investors and Canadian, you can buy an ETF that's along the yen. So it's a very easy thing to play. There are opportunities out there. I think the dividend aristocrats, which have been lagging for so many years, uh, are going to catch up at some point. I think that you talked about energy earlier and. Uh, some of these MLPs, there's one that yields 9% and ra it raised its distribution even through 2020 when most of its peers cut its distribution. It's it's recently made a new all-time high. So technically, it's very good. I think just looking for companies in general that are breaking out from that 
kind of that range expansion that we talked about. And interestingly, I think the insurance industry is one of the ones that uh, that qualifies. Some of these major PNC companies are reporting fantastic earnings and are are making new multi-year highs or new all-time highs. And it's in, in many cases it's earnings driven, and those are my favorite kind of breakouts. So emerging market debt that's been a favorite area of ours. You got to be really selective, but uh, countries like Brazil, I think, are in extremely good shape and, and are attractive bond markets. So there's definitely opportunities out there, and uh, you know, it's. But I, I think that the opportunities are generally where people aren't putting their their money. You know, those people that are emailing you and texting you and bragging about how much they're making, they're not going into these areas, which makes me feel better, frankly. Yeah, there's only a, about a dozen or so plays. I mean, they're playing uh, stock options on the NASDAQ 100 or some of the MAG7 stocks. So it's very, very selective with what the average uh, American retail investor is trading right now. But I, I agree with you. I see a lot of contrarian value across the board in commodities. Now, uranium has had an enormous rally, but if there was mm -hmm. a big pullback, a correction or a crash, I'd be very interested because I think long term there's a nuclear power bull market. But at these valuations, it's just a little too high for me. I agree. I think we talked about uranium the last time I was on, and it was at a point where it was still viable. But yeah, it's uh, that Sprite uranium uh, ETF has just gone bonkers. And you're right, it's uh, Cameco, which is kind of the blue chip way to play the uranium miners, pretty pricey. So it's tough. To me, it, you know, you look at traditional energy, and there's just so many values, stocks that are trading at five, six, seven times earnings. In many cases, they have a great yield. And, you know, maybe that's something to talk about because you probably are aware that. My friend Doomberg got a lot of uh, press here recently by, you know, he would say I'm not bearish on oil, but he certainly challenged the peak cheap oil thesis that I believe in. And a lot of the people I respect in the energy industry do believe in. And uh, boy, it was, uh, I've never seen anything that he's done that created that kind of firestorm. And, you know, he's a brilliant guy, but I disagree with him in this case. And, uh, and I don't know how much you want to talk about energy, but I think there's well, some very I, misunderstood things. I was an oil analyst for my day job for stocks many, many years ago for a newsletter company. So I, I do know a lot. I've interviewed a lot of the top oil newsletter writers. I actually interviewed Dan Steffens from Houston, Texas. He was a senior executive at Hess Oil. So he might be someone that you want to speak to about this. Basically, like the natural gas liquids price. I mean, if the refiners keep switching, right, and making... um you know, gasoline and, and diesel with natural gas liquids. I mean, they're going to drive the price up on natural gas liquids enormously, and it's not going to be a good arbitrage for them to keep switching away from like not, um, away from conventional oil and then using natural gas liquids. So Doomberg is going to be right for a short amount of time, but eventually then the price is going to go too high and their finers will switch back. Right. And I, I question how much capacity there is in the refining industry to do it. You, you probably know this. The last time there was a, a, a significant new refinery built in America was like 1978. I mean, we have now we've done some expansions and certainly we have the, the best refining complex in the world. But ironically, that's a bit of a challenge because, as you know, and very few people do, the, the reason that we've become energy independent, you know, with this caveat that I'm going to mention is because of shale oil. And shale oil is almost gasoline. It is so light when it, it comes out of the ground. And that's why when you've seen these tra train derailments of shale oil, they blow up. You know, they, they've obviously done a better There's, job in recent years, but there were the, a number the wells of those are that also, All the wells in the Permian are also at least 30% natural gas. So there's all that extra natural right. gas. So if they're drilling right. at record amounts, I mean, there's a lot of extra natural gas and natural gas liquids. But if the if the rig count starts to fall, I mean, that's going to be less natural gas and natural gas liquids. The the refiners just have proven their the refiners are innovative and have figured out a cheaper input, but that can switch. They can they It's a hydrocarbon chain and they can switch back. My point is that the U.S. refining complex is not well suited to the oil that we produce. Oh, yeah. It needs, it prefers heavy oil from Canada or from Venezuela. And that heavy oil, you know, obviously Venezuela can barely provide enough oil for its own energy needs. But our oil is very desirable in South America, Latin America, China, you know, these much less uh, sophisticated refineries, refineries. But our oil, it, that's why we're really not truly energy independent. Mike Rothman from Cornerstone Analytics is always saying this. He's one of the best in the world on the energy markets, I believe. And we can talk about him in a moment because of his long running battle with the IEA. And that is a very important topic. But anyway, so we, we've got we, we need we need that heavy oil and they need our oil. So it's a you know, it's a it's a nice trading situation. But the um, you yeah, know, the NGLs, I, I think that's it's a little bit unrealistic to expect a barrel of NGL to be as a, you know equivalent to a barrel of oil. I think they're just 
there's a big difference. And you brought up the rig count. So the rig count is falling. Not that it will. It is falling. Now, this, and this is another thing which I think should have been brought up in this debate uh, with uh, with Duberg, and I, I'm going to do so in my next. So I've done one uh, kind of very polite pushback to his thesis, and I'm going to do a second one coming up here soon. And one of the points I'm going to make is that uh, the drill but uncompleted wells, which were you know rocketed during COVID, because there are all these wells that had been drilled, kind of like homes that were built but left half completed inventory. And yeah, so that. So you had this big backlog of drilled but uncompleted wells to work off. And what's, what I've only seen one chart, there's there's a few charts that float around, not many, that just show the DOC is way, way down. That's the nickname from Ducks, the drilled but uncompleted wells. Uh, but what's where it's really been dramatic is in the Permian, where the, the, the DOCs were extremely high and have been brought way down to rock bottom. And I think that's huge because you can no longer get away with this very low level of drilling now that you've depleted the inventory of DUCs. And that could be why you're starting to see the production growth really slow down in recent months in the Permian. And that's huge because the Permian, I mean, the only source of growth in the world, the production growth has really been the U.S. over the last 15 years. And most of that has been from the Permian. In fact, all the other shale basins in the U.S. are actually declining now. And you're right about the natural gas. But the, a lot of the reason why there is a lot of natural, more natural gas coming out of the Permian, even with the decline of the rig count, is because there's more takeaway capacity. As you know, there was a there weren't enough pipelines, and so there was a lot of gas flaring that was going on. More pipelines have been put in place, so now that gas is getting to market, which is a good thing. But it does depress natural gas prices. I mean, natural gas prices are what a buck sixty right now. I mean, just there's not many many of the natural gas producers can make money at that price. I know if you go further out of time, the price goes up, but it's still pretty low. I think it's two, thirty, or forty in the summer. Uh, but they're starting to cut back their drilling as well. So it's just the old thing, you know. The cure for low prices is low prices, and these natural gas prices at these levels just don't make sense. And, and I, I think, think also natural gas is a great contrarian buy. There's been a, some large mergers and acquisitions to like ExxonMobil and Pioneer. And as that transaction is completed, I'm not sure exactly when it'll be completed, but I don't expect them to rapidly increase production. So I think it's going to be a steadier, slower pace going forward at them and Diamondback. And I think uh, Chevron may have bought some assets too, although most of their investment with uh, Hess Oil is for deep water for Guyana. Right. But then you just had the, the Diamondback and Endeavor merger as well. And so, yeah, I think these guys get it. They they realize that, you know, the boom days are over, you know, where they can really rapidly grow production. Production is going to be much tougher to grow. And they are they realize that they're just going to have to manage their capital very in a very disciplined way, which means, you know, they only drill their best prospects. And if they merge, then they pick the best prospects of the two companies. They're going to keep costs way down. And when these mergers happen, I mean, the number one thing they do is, you know, lay people off and, that's probably going to make the the jobs numbers look worse, and uh, they're they're going to buy back shares. They're going to uh, pay down debt. So as as long as it's cheaper to acquire new oil reserves on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange than it is in the Permian or uh, the Haynesville, that's what's going to happen. So it's uh, th- it's not not the same oil industry that was very ir- irresponsible for quite a while. So I think that the production growth profile is going to be going to disappoint those that think that uh, that the U.S. is an unlimited source of shale oil growth. Oh, yeah, I agree. There's not the amount of capital available from private equity and pension funds and institutional investors that there was during the shale boom from about 2009 up until about 2016. So there, that that type of capital, those trillions of dollars to go and and grow revenues like a Silicon Valley tech company, not focus on profits and earnings and free cash flow and good margins, that capital is not available. So the companies are going to be a lot more careful when they deploy capital going forward. Yes, and I think that why that matters is I believe, and I was going to say this earlier, I spent a few hours one-on-one with John Hathaway from Sprott, Tocqueville, who's considered to be one of the finest gold investors ever to, to walk the face of the earth. And he thinks that that like I do that the energy company I'm sorry the gold mining companies are going to behave more like the energy companies in the way they manage their other capital and there it's also a situation where it's getting very very hard to find new gold reserves if you look at reserves in the ground they're way down from what they used to be so I, I think these guys are going to merge they're already starting to do that and keep their costs down and and just be much better stewards of capital than they have been in, in recent years because you look at 
the gold companies, and even with gold at over 2000, gold was at average, I think, 1600 back in 2012. So gold's up 25%, and yet these guys' profits are way down. Whereas with the oil, the oil companies, oil and gas prices were much higher back in 2012 than they are today. And yet the profitability of the leading oil and gas companies is much better than it was then. So I think you're going to see these miners act more like the oil and gas producers is really my point. I saw an interview with Paul Sankey, who's a supposed oil expert. Well, he's been working in the in the oil industry for, mm -hmm. for decades, but he basically said that the Saudis were subsidizing the oil market now. And if the Saudis hadn't cut production, the oil price would be at $40. I was just thinking like, None of the OPEC countries or Russia can fund their their government spending their government budgets or their social programs spending at oil at forty. So, and, and then you'd see the recount just collapse. Yeah, well, well, I think what's what he's saying has got some logic to it. But I think the other side of it, and this is again one of my quibbles with my friend, is that what was the SPR doing? It was dumping with three hundred million barrels of oil onto the market, and that's what the Saudis were really trying to push back against. So you have to look at both sides of the ledger. The other thing, which is a huge problem for most people in the energy market, is they listen to the IEA, the International Energy Agency, which has just been so horrible. I mean, they're extremely politicized. They have their reasons for wanting to make it sound like oil demand is way lower than it is. So they just chronically underestimate demand to the point where it's now totals three billion dollars. I'm sorry, three billion barrels, three billion barrels of demand underestimation they've made. They did a, and they do these just kind of like with the jobs numbers. You know, they, they you do these revisions and it doesn't get any press. They just kind of sneak it, you know, sneak it by. And so back in 2019, I believe it was, they did a two billion barrel reduction. And now since that time, it's it's gotten up another billion dollars, uh, a billion barrels rather. And they keep saying, well, this is missing oil and it must be out there somewhere, but the missing oil never shows up. So it's just incredible to me, as wrong as they've been for as long as they've been, that anybody listens to them, but they are can still considered to be the authority on the oil market. So they keep telling the world that you know the supply is is going to grow rapidly. They've been wrong about that, uh, and they've especially been wrong about demand, which they have just fantastically underestimated, as I just described. But at oil below fifty dollars, I mean, almost no one except for the Saudis and a few other low cost producers, maybe Chevron or Exxon Mobil, almost no one else can make money consistently. So, I mean, the sure. industry then is going to cut supply. They're going to fire employees. I mean, that's a bear market oil sub 50 at this point with how much costs are up and how we're almost at a tier one acreage in the Permian. Well, we just said, I think it's critical. I kind of alluded to that earlier is that they've been high grading uh, for years and that's how they've been able to main, maintain production along with the DUCs that we talked about earlier. Uh, and those things are, are largely played out. So with the, the drilling rate count down, you know, significantly like 20, 25 percent, you know, that's going to start to bite at some point. But where I think you're really going to see it for the reasons you just mentioned is with natural gas, where you get natural gas down to such a low level that uh, I think the, you know, the number of rigs shut down and gas is going to be surprising. Now you can say, well, you'll still get that associated gas out of the Permian. But if the Permian is rolling over, and I think there's very little doubt about that. I wouldn't be surprised to see some negative numbers, you know, on a monthly basis coming up this year out of the Permian. So that gas surge is not going to exit. Like well, new pipelines, and but I don't, I don't think you're going to see very many new pipelines being built. That's kind of a, a game that was has been played over the last few years. So I, I think at some point you're going to create a shortage of natural gas again because prices got too low. Well, or or the U.S. is going to be exporting a lot of that that natural gas. It's an arbitrage, cheaper gas prices here in the U.S. to more expensive liquefied natural gas. So domestically, it's not going to be used as much. It's going to be exported for a higher price by liquefied natural gas. So even though you have the Biden policies, I mean, whoever takes over in the next administration, not sure if Biden's going to win re-election. I mean, look at the polling, but we'll we'll have to see. But if there is a Republican in the White House, I mean, the odds are pretty high that those liquefied natural gas uh, facilities won't be blocked and there will be construction then and then there will be a lot new a lot more uh, liquefied natural gas uh, export facilities over the next seven to ten years i actually wanted to ask you though about comments by the ceo of occidental petroleum they said that there's going to be a pretty severe oil shortage by 2025 do you agree with the ceo of occidental petroleum you know what vicky hello hmm? Well, yeah, I heard some of her comments, which perplexed me because she was saying that she thinks there is this kind of floating glut of oil out there. And ironically, since she said that, oil prices have actually been rising. But if she's saying longer term, and I think that was the rest of her commentary, is longer term, she sees a shortage, I would say absolutely, uh, for all the reasons I've talked about. 
I think there is going to be, uh, I mean, the demand just keeps growing. And you've got so many people that have listened to the IEA that say, no, you, you know, don't want to invest in energy because we don't need it anymore and the demand is going to weaken. And you know, the other thing I think people are ignoring is look at the tr tr problems that the EV industry is suddenly having. It's almost every day you pick up the paper about another problem with an EV manufacturer and how they're cutting back and how the inventories and dealer lots are, you know, are at, uh, at record highs. And I think that's that whole transition. And, and the thing that is kind of amazing about it is if you look at Norway, where 65% of new car sales are EVs, their oil usage is actually slightly up from where it was 10 years ago. That's one of the more amazing factoids out there, but it's, uh, and I've got the data to back that up. So I, yeah, I think there's going to be a serious shortage and yeah, we, if we get the price high enough, and that's kind of what Doomberg was saying, is that if we get into a crisis situation, we've got all kinds of levers we can pull. But the crisis situation is going to mean prices a lot higher than you know seventy seven or seventy eight WTI. That's an interesting point about electric vehicles and this ESG bubble. I mean, it looks like Tesla Motors is going to be okay, even though their sales numbers are down. But the rest of the industry, I mean, there was a bankruptcy for a United Kingdom electric vehicle manufacturer. A lot of the other ones are in major, major trouble. Uh, the, the normal car dealers, like there's tons of articles about this. They want to send their uh, electric vehicles back to the manufacturer. They want the manufacturers like Ford and General Motors to buy back the electric vehicles because they're not selling. That one, uh, Ford's already losing about 60,000 per EV that they sell. I mean, it's just, it's been a lot of very poor thinking by policymakers that have tried to make this transition happen almost overnight without really thinking about is the market demand there? And, you know, if you give huge incentives, you know, maybe you can do it. But, you know, at some point, I think, you know, this gets back to the bond market. At some point, the government just can't keep running these $2 trillion federal deficits without there being some really painful consequences. So I think, you know, the green, great green energy transition has been one of my beliefs that we're in this uh, yeah, higher inflation period because so much of that money is being wasted or having a very low return on, 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 cap, on, invested, uh, on investment. Uh, return on energy investment is, uh, is quite low with a lot of these renewable projects. So I, I just, yeah, I think that's another reason why you probably should be bullish on oil and gas. Plus, I keep coming back to the fact that almost everybody hates them right now. Have you seen any of the projections by any of the agencies for electricity usage if all these data centers are installed, big data centers, Bitcoin mining, all the stuff needed, all the technology stack for artificial intelligence over the next six or seven years, the the electricity demand projections? It's insane, actually. Oh, it is. It's insane. And and the grid is is already fragile. It's already overtaxed. So, you know, I think, frankly, from an investment standpoint, you know, whenever there's problems, there's opportunities. I think some of the generator companies are pretty interesting. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think, yes, you're exactly right. And I think that is going to become more acute, not less acute. So I think the demand for coal, I mean, coal demand, shockingly, despite all these policy objectives for ESG and electric vehicles, I mean, coal usage, I think, actually hit a record high in 2023. Oh, it did. And you've got uh, over a thousand coal plants that are either under construction or going to be built. Uh, you've, you know, we talked about nuclear. There's a big nuclear renaissance going. So, yeah, there's there's a realization. And finally, I think uh, facing the facts that we can't run the global economy on intermittent power sources. And you look at what happened with Germany when they had when Russia turned off, uh, you know, the, the gas taps. They went with uh, coal. And they went with burning wood and you know dirty forms of energy. But when their backs were against the wall, all their you know very lofty environmental goals went right out the window. And that's you know that's also what Doomberg is saying is that if we get into that in the United States, we'll do the same thing. We've got all these huge coal reserves, and that's true. But again, I think there has to be a crisis first, and I don't think you can have uh, oil prices where they are today in a crisis. I think they're going to be much much higher. And if artificial intelligence is successful, uh, they're planning th these investments for the data centers here in Northern Virginia. I mean, the enormous amount of them as part of the uh, technologies needed for artificial intelligence. I mean, the the amount of electricity that is projected to be increased the usage, it could be double in the next six or seven years. So if artificial intelligence like the no one's talking about this, that let's say artificial intelligence is implemented, is invested by these big tech companies, the federal government, cybersecurity, uh, S&P 500 companies. I mean, the electricity usage globally, it could potentially double in under 10 years. Right. No, that's it's true. And you know, that's one reason why I tell my team we're going to need a lot of natural gas for exactly that reason. 
So you think then there's good risk reward is, is energy then the, the old conventional forms of energy, you think some of the best risk reward opportunities then in, in any of the industries or sectors right now? I do. I do, but some of the other commodities too. I mean, I still think there's going to be a lot more EVs on the road in three or four years than there are today. I just think it's gonna be a lot less than what the, you know, the politicians were hoping for. Uh, but so, you know, things like copper, I do think that there's a, a really good story for copper. Lithium has been absolutely crushed. So, you know, maybe some of the lithium producers are worth, worth nibbling on. But, uh, yeah, I think that traditional oil and gas producers are some of the most attractive investments on the face of the earth right now. The problem with electric vehicles, there's not a, a good enough infrastructure. So all the charging stuff at people's homes or charging stations where people can go into a charging station and out and not wait on a long line or in their or in their apartment building or condo, there's not enough of that stuff yet. The infrastructure that we have been promised for that type of stuff is not there. Also with these electric, uh, the pickup trucks with electric vehicles, those things don't haul. <laughs> I've seen three or four of the electric vehicle pickup trucks. They look great. I don't see anything, any type of like, couple hundred pounds, no no um, agriculture person or construction business. No one's running their business for some of those normal conventional small business owners or subcontractors out of their uh, electric vehicle pickup truck. You cannot haul tonnage like that without diesel and without normal torque. And they don't do too great in cold weather either. I think what makes more sense, and I, I do think that there is a shift going this way, certainly Toyota has been leading the way towards hybrids. I think hybrids are a much better transition to electrifying the auto fleet than trying to go hardcore full on EVs. So I, I think that that, you know, that probably has some decent legs to it. And, you know, that's going to reduce oil demand to a certain degree, but uh, there's a lot of upside drivers, particularly out of the developing world. That's that's what the IEA has, has missed, maybe intentionally. Uh, there's been very little, in fact, there's actually been negative growth and OECD, so rich world demand for oil over the last 15 years, but you know, very rapid demand growth in emerging markets, and I think that will continue. So last question before I let you go, there's actually a lot of net insider selling, especially like by the tech insiders like Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, some of the large cap tech people, they're large net insider selling. There's other large net insider selling in other major industries. I think gold mining has the only net insider buying. Hardly anyone's talking about it yet. Do you think that some of these gold miners, the low cost ones with clean balance sheets, is this are these some of the cheapest companies in any sector right now? Yeah, absolutely. And again, going back to my conversation with John Hathaway, uh, you know, he's talking about the companies that they track. They're selling at four and five times cash flow. And, you know, that may not be free cash flow. I'm sure it's not. The free cash flow numbers are probably more like you know, 10, 11, 12 times. But uh, still, I mean, that's when you consider the optionality that you get with these. And what I mean by that is that, you know, if, if, if the view that you have and I have is that there is a major revision to the price of gold coming up, and you got to factor that into your your evaluation of these miners. I mean, they if you can get gold to three thousand dollars an ounce, I mean, they are just going to generate profits that are absolutely obscene, and even a twenty five hundred an ounce. So yes, I think uh, I think there uh, it makes sense that the insiders would be buying them right now. So you you actually have an estimate that you think gold prices could be at twenty five hundred dollars an ounce in the near future. Yeah, don't ask me when the near future is, but I think that's a relatively conservative target given what, uh, you know, the financial condition the U.S. is in. Probably in a decade or less. I mean, the cost for a lot of these oh, miners. I think, less. Hmm? I think huh? a, lot, a lot sooner than that. Yeah. Well, I there's was... people, I mean, you listen to people at uh, Gary and Rosenzweig. I mean, they're using numbers of 10,000, 20,000. Uh, we're talking, you know, several years down the road. But it's, uh, you know, I think that's not something that most people, I mean, you know, our industry is very skewed away from hard assets. And so if you look at the typical portfolio manager, they have minuscule uh, gold holdings. It's zero. Yeah. For gold miners, yeah, it's zero. I mean, I, I speak to hedge fund managers and institutional investors. I have friends with some really famous generalist hedge fund managers. They told me if they have gold gold mining stocks in their portfolio, they're risking career risk and getting fired. <laughs> yeah, well, that's music to my ears. You know, what's funny is that back in 2020, they absolutely went bonkers. We made more money for clients in those few months kind of from April of 2020 to August or September than I've ever made in anything, including having some of the great tech stocks late 90s. But they've been dogs since then, and that's what happens. I mean, these guys go through long periods where they do very poorly, and then they just explode. 
But because they do poorly for such a long period of time, there's hardly anybody that holds them when they they go vertical. And you know, we've we've been pretty fortunate, frankly, in being willing to take profits when they run and and buy them when they're down. Now we're certainly not perfect, but uh, we've been better than the average bear, no pun intended. Well, the industry is also dealing with a bear market despite relatively high metals prices, like you said. I mean, we have gold prices above two thousand dollars an ounce in U.S. dollars. It's the gold price in other currencies is at or near an all time high. And yet these gold mining companies, uh, their cost of capital is high. For a junior miner, they might not have any capital available. They're on the phone or email trying to trying to sell the company or negotiate a joint venture deal just to survive for the next six to 12 months to get any capital, a little bit of investment from a larger miner so they can uh, they can keep the lights on. I mean, it's, it's a dire bear market for a lot of these uh, companies. Yeah, for sure. But I wouldn't just say it's junior gold mining. I mean, you've seen some of the stats, I'm sure, on what's happening to small companies in general in the United States. You know, having to pay eight to nine percent interest rate on their money, and uh, with you know tough in many cases tough economic conditions in their industry, so it's yeah, it's a I don't think it's just a gold mining specific problem. Oh yeah, I agree. Even Silicon Valley, I mean, the capital available for a lot of these Silicon Valley unicorns is just not there, and that's why you're seeing bankruptcies with WeWork and some of the others because they can't do the normal types of capital raises with revenue only business models and making their own metrics on their investors' presentations. Yep. No, it's, uh, some of the chickens are coming home to roost. Well, I really enjoyed our discussion today, David. If my listeners want to Thanks, check Jason. out your... Hmm? I said thank you, Jason. If my listeners want to check out your book, because it's a, a very appropriate time right now about the bubble, and then also your newsletter, the Haymaker newsletter, how did they do so? Thank you for bringing that up. So you can get both at our Substack website. So it's haymaker underscore Substack. Uh, the book is up there. And you can download it. I think quite sure there's no charge in doing that still. And our newsletter is mostly behind the paywall. We, it was open for a lot of years, but there's still quite a bit of free content there. But you know, I think given the, the fact that we actually give actionable investment ideas on a weekly basis, it's even our, uh, our paid version is uh, a steal. But I'm a little biased. <laughs>